we're doing induction or not induction. It's up to us. And I want to demonstrate here two cases of induction. If I press the first domino, all right, wasn't perfect, but you got the point. And let's see what's going to happen here if I press. Oh, and the last one fell down because I was trying to demonstrate infinite induction with the white dominoes and finite induction with the black one, black ones. And we will see how this ties up with our problems. So some of you have seen induction before. While I'm explaining the basics, you try the following problem on your own. Take any square and into how many smaller squares you can cut it up. So I want to know the number n of smaller squares, all of them. So can you cut it up into seven smaller squares, into 20, 21 smaller squares? And of course, when you're cutting it up, it means no overlaps and no funky business. It's like a tiling on the wall. Everything goes exactly in one spot. So what is induction? Induction is a scheme or rather a vehicle that you use to get from one point to another, in particular to prove your mathematical statement. But induction doesn't work without a driver and you will be the driver. You need to come up with creative ideas to fit within this vehicle. So let me give you a problem that you may or may not have seen before. It's a very famous one. Find how many subsets does a set with n elements have? So what am I talking about? If you have three people, how many groups can you extract from them? And so you can fiddle around and maybe you will come up with the answer eight. That seems like a lot, but actually that's the case and we will show it. And then you try with perhaps four people and you know, you count, count, count and you come up with 16. And of course you start seeing a pattern and you're saying, oh, maybe the answer is a certain power of two and the power of the exponent looks like it's the number of people or the number of elements. And at this point you say, I'm gonna conjecture that the answer for this problem, which I'm going to call S sub n, so number of subsets, if you have n people, is precisely 2 to the n, where n is greater than or equal to 1. And now that you have this conjecture, induction can kick in. One of the drawbacks of induction, not to disappoint you, but I have to tell you right away, is that you need to know the answer ahead of time. Induction by itself is not going to tell it to you. But once you have it or some annoying classmate of yours gives it to you, pretending they know too much, you can use induction and try to prove it. So how do we prove this particular warm-up problem? So induction starts with turning on the engine, your key, ignition. So we're going to call it the BS, base step. Usually they call it base case, but BS really caught you. So base case or base step n equals to 1. So for one person, how many subsets do we have? Well, we're supposed to show 2 to the first 2. Of course, I can have this person A by themselves alone. Where is the other subset? Brady, do you see another subset here? Is it no people? Yes, no people. We forgot about them. Great. So that's 2. We are done with the BS. Next. I'm going to do something called inductive hypothesis, IH. So I'm going to make a bold, bold assumption. We shall assume our statement is true for some n greater than or equal to 1. And by that I mean a natural number. I'm not going to tell you what this number is. And that's the key because I want a general frame that works. And then the creative part of induction, this is where you come in, how to show that the next statement is also true. What you saw with the dominoes, we place the dominoes close to each other so that when one domino tips, the other one is also going to tip. 
and fall over. That is precisely what we are doing. We are assuming that the nth domino falls and is going to trigger the n plus first to do the same thing. Okay, so in this problem, we want to show that uh, if you have n plus one people, that means you have two to the n plus one subsets. Okay, how does this work? Here are my n plus one people. I'm just drawing a few points, n plus one. We're going to call one of them Brady. And Brady will either be selected on a team to go to the moon or not. So we want to know how many such teams we can send to the moon from those people. So if Brady is not selected, so Brady is not happy, he's not going to go to the moon, how many teams do we have? It means that we are choosing teams or subsets from the remaining n people. But we already assumed that our statement is true. In other words, for n people, I have two to the n teams or subsets. Uh -huh. So if Brady is not participating, I have two to the n teams. Now, if Brady is participating, how many teams? Well, what is such a team? Such a team will contain Brady and probably a bunch of the others, right? But then such a team means that I have to choose the non-Brady part and add to that part Brady. So Brady is not relevant again, unfortunately. I just have to choose a team without Brady, two to the n of those teams by our inductive hypothesis, and then at Brady. Okay, so how many do we have now overall? All I have to do is add 2n plus 2n, so that's 2 times 2 to the n, 2 to the n plus 1 teams. Excellent. So we just showed the inductive step. And here, if you want to be absolutely formal, you want to receive a receipt for your proof, you have to make a conclusion. The conclusion says, therefore, all statements S, N, R, true for all n greater than or equal to 1. This seems like a lot to say, but actually that is the domino effect. If you believe that when the dominoes are placed close to each other, then once you push the first one, all of them will fall, then you should agree with this. Or alternatively, let's think about Grindelwald, evil magician. Okay, so he does all sorts of bad things on an island. The good magicians gather together and they're going to exile him. Upon leaving the island, Grindelwald casts an evil spell. If it rains one day, it's going to rain the next day. It rains today. Will it rain forever, Brady, on this island? What do you think? I think it will, yeah. 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 And so it means that Brady believes in the method of mathematical induction. Because in this example with the evil spell, what is the BS? The BS, or base step, is it rains today. What is the inductive hypothesis and the inductive step? Well, that's the magic spell. The inductive hypothesis would be if it rains one day. And the inductive step will be, therefore, it's going to rain the next day. And so we're going to conclude that, in this case, Grindelwald will win. On that island, it will rain every single day. So you might think about the domino effect. It's a little bit more optimistic. But either way, it will work. Now, just a little bit of a switch here. Once you realize that the statement for the number of teams was correct for n greater than or equal to 1, you start asking yourself, can I slightly extend this? Does induction always have to start with n equals to 1? How about n equals to 0? Would that work? So if you have no people, how many teams do you have? Brady, what do you think? 2 to the 0. 2 to the 0, which is 1, and what's that team? That's the empty one. Wow, so we are extending actually our formula to one more case. And indeed, induction can start from wherever the statements uh, are true. It could start from 10, or you can even start it from negative 5. 
So now we are ready for the squares. Remember, into how many small squares can we cut up a square without any monkey business? No overlaps, no other stuff. So n is going to be the number of squares, and then we will say whether we can do it or not. Okay, so if n is 1, obviously, we can do it. This is our square. There is nothing to talk about. But once we start going higher, things get trickier. Brady, just think and tell me one of those cases where you think it's definitely possible to split a square into smaller ones. Four. Four! Yes, and how do you propose I split this into four smaller squares? You cut that in half vertically and horizontally. Correct, and we're going to call this the window technique. We see a nice window here, so four is fine. Um, anything else? Mm, I could use this you one. Could, you could window all those squares. Oh, I can window in one of those. And how many did they get? Did they get eight? No, no. we've got seven. Se what, what happened? So seven? is okay, but what happened? Every time you use the window technique, you are replacing one square with four, which means that you are adding only three. So once I have seven, what else would I have? Ten. Ten, because we will start adding threes here. Excellent, and obviously I can have then 13, which is out here. But now what? I still have some gaps, what am I going to do with the others? This is not so easy anymore. Maybe I'll help you unless you've already discovered how to do it. Is there a way to do it for six? Now we have to be more inventive, okay? So suppose for a moment I split this into nine squares, right? And everyone agrees into nine, it's possible. Oh. So that's possible. And then I'm going to use only some of those for my six squares. In particular, these four squares will be now lumped into one large square. Well, how many did they get? One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, so six works. And then from six on, oh, this is really fun because I know how to do nine. That was our original cutting, but now I have another way to do nine, right? I can use the window technique on my six and split like that. But at any rate, we now know that with the window technique, we can go and cover another long sequence of, of events here. We can do it six, nine, 12. Um, I wonder, can we roll back to three? Can you possibly do it with three? I can't quite see it, so let me just let this boil a little bit simmer on the back burner. Um, something else, how about eight? Can we do it with eight? What we did with six can be generalized for eight. So for eight, you could in principle do the following, cut the side into four equal parts, just those two sides, and then go straight only along some of those, and finally cut up the remainder. So you're gonna get one large, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total, so seven small squares, so that's eight. So we are done for eight, and that will trigger 11 with the window technique, 14, and looks like we are fine from now on. Yeah. So Brady, what do you conjecture based on this table? When is it possible? From where on is it possible? Well, so far, it seems like it's possible from six everywhere onwards. Correct. That's where the dominoes start. That, yeah, and actually that's what I will conjecture. We will conjecture that this is true or possible for n greater than or equal to 6. Why are you conjecturing it? I feel like you've proven it. Well, I said and so on. Every time when you start saying and so on, etc., etc., it means that you are applying induction in disguise. You're just not communicating this to your audience. Now, if you were a seasoned mathematician, that would be enough for them. They know how to formally package this kind of situation into induction.
But if you are just starting with induction, you haven't done it before, you may need a little bit of help here. And uh, before I show you how to do this formally, I want to answer the questions for the remaining gap. So what is going on with 2, 3, and 5? The answer here is no for all three of them. So these are kind of sporadic cases where you cannot do it. But the proof that it is impossible for 2, 3, and 5 is completely different from induction. And in fact, showing it for three may not, or may be helpful for five, but definitely that's not going to be an inductive proof. So what shall we tackle first, the induction or those sporadic cases? What do you think, Brady? I'd like to get rid of those sporadic cases. First, okay. Yeah. I'm going to leave two for homework, because after you see the cases for three and five, you may quickly finish off for two. So let us see how it works for three and five. So suppose you can split a square into three smaller squares. So we're reasoning by contradiction. I'm going to use then three of those smaller squares and push them onto my bigger square. So this is the one I want to tile. There are some ground rules here. There are corners in my big square. Well, how many little squares can I use in a corner here? Can I use two? I don't think so. Because once I start doing things like that, it's going to come out of my big square, and that's, that's no good. What we conclude from here is that every corner of our square will be covered by exactly one of our smaller squares. That's what everyone should agree on. Okay, but then we are in trouble because how many corners do I have, Brady? You got four. And I have how many squares did we say? You're aiming for three. For three. So what must happen? One of those small squares better cover two corners or else we just can't do it. Let's say the green square is going to cover the remaining corner, but what happens then? Overlaps overlaps and I covered the whole thing with it. Well, that's against the rules. Now let us do it with five squares and show that it is impossible for five. We have four corners, so in this case, we have an excess of one little square. And as we reasoned before, I cannot have a single square, like the green one, cover two corners, because it will cover the whole thing immediately. So somehow the fifth square has to be in between the others. Hmm. But now I have leftover sides, like right here, between those two adjacent squares. So I need to cover those, those parts too. Is it possible for one small square to cover two opposite pieces like that? Only if it's the size of the whole square. Exactly, and I will let this for you to play around and see. It's just gonna cover the whole thing. So our fifth square is going to dominate everything and immediately show a contradiction. Okay. We still don't lose hope. We say, okay, we cannot cover two opposite ones. Maybe I can cover two adjacent pieces. What will happen? In that case, it means that this brown fictitious square, well, its sides still have to meet. It's going to go over our blue square, and we don't want that. Again, we don't lose hope. We say, fine, I'm just going to restrict to covering only one piece on the side with my fifth square. But that means that all of the remaining black pieces here have to be covered by the original four squares. So I have to enlarge them in order to do this. Okay, so I will start enlarging the purple and the green one. They don't have to meet in the middle. They can meet a little bit off like that. That's fine. I can start enlarging the blue one, yes. And I start seeing trouble. Now the red one is supposed to meet at least the green or the blue one. N not both, right? But if it starts meeting, let's say, the green one, what, what do we see? We have covered everything. There is no place for a fifth one and we are overlapping. If I do, for example, try to meet the blue one, 
I'll again do the same thing. So you need to label the sides probably x, uh, 1 minus x, and so on and so forth. Go around and really complete this argument. But visually, it is obvious there is no place for the fifth square anymore. So we cannot do it with 5. We cannot do it with 3. And for homework, show that you can't do it with 2. Now, where is the induction here? Mathematicians will tell you that if you can prove a statement without induction, in other words, directly, go ahead and do it. But you may not see that direct way. And that's why I'm going to demonstrate for you something called strong induction. We need strong induction here in order to technically wrap up this solution. So how does it work? What is our base step? It turns out for strong induction, you may need several base steps. And you can easily convince yourself that you will need three base steps for 6, 7, and 8. And uh, you will say n equals to 6, 7, and 8. And you will demonstrate for all these three cases, which we already did. Now, what is the inductive hypothesis? Now, mm, this is going to be tough because I'm going to seem to assume more than what I did before. But in fact, these are equivalent methods. So I'm going to assume all statements S sub n, where n is the number of small squares, are true for all n from 6, 7, 8, up to somewhere, let's call it k. So I'm just not going to tell you k. But note what I have just done. I have assumed a whole bunch of statements, including my three base cases. If k is 8, we are done. I'm not doing anything extra. But if k is more, I'm actually making an assumption. So what do we want to prove? Inductive step is the creative one. We want to show that s sub n plus 1 is true. So what does it mean? That we can go one for the case higher. Now, why is this happening? So I have gone up to n, just imagine the real line. We know that 6, 7, and 8 are true, and, and maybe some more, let's say up to here, this k. And now we want to go one more higher, right? So let's say n plus 1. As I said, my variable's a little bit funky, but that's okay. So why is this case true? As we saw, messing around, the initial messing around with the problem, in order to do 12, you wanted to go back with three steps and kind of undo one window technique. And that's precisely what you're going to do here. You will go back three steps. Do you still land on a statement that is assumed to be true, or did you accidentally fly outside? and land it on 5, which we know already is not true. The answer is no. You are still within the cases that you assumed were true because you have this barrier of three base cases that don't allow you to fly over them when you subtract 3. So you again land on a statement that is true. So you have some square that you have somehow partitioned artistically into subsquares, and all you have to do is go back by adding one window technique to it and three more. And that way you will show that the next statement is true and then you will do this magic conclusion by the method of mathematical induction. All of those statements are true. This is indeed using the method of mathematical induction. They are direct proofs. I can give you a hint. First, do this problem for, let's say, a very large even number. What's such a large even number? Like 2,000. Can you directly divide it into 2,000? You can do something like 6 and 8, what we did before. So I will split the sides into how many subsquares do you think, Brady? A nice number. Any number? Any, no, it has to work. Oh, okay. See, for 8, we cut it down into 4. For 2,000, 
maybe we should cut it into 1,000. Yeah. So you're going to cut the side into 1,000 squares, and then you will draw these lines and continue doing your small sub-squares and one large. How many do we have? You may think we have 1,000 plus 1,000 plus 1, but you are wrong because we are just overcounting this corner. So you have to subtract that and bingo, you have your 2,000. Uh -huh. I think this example is general enough for you to try even numbers right away. And then how would you do an odd number? If you add 3 to 2,000, you get an odd number. So you just have to hit one of those little squares with the window technique and you will get odd numbers. Okay, so you can wrap this up into a direct proof that will nevertheless use two cases, even numbers and odd numbers. And you still cannot get five. There is no way you can get five because if you go three backwards, you're going to land on two, and that's the first and only even number for which this is impossible. Let's try to throw pies at each other. I'm sure you have seen those old black and white movies where everyone's having fights and pieing each other. Not 3.14 pie, actual pie actual eating pie and the funny thing is we're gonna call it the odd pie five but it's not that the pie is odd but the number of people involved is odd so you have odd number of people and and they're standing somewhere so that no two pairs have the same distance so if i take any two different pairs of people a b c d I will see that AB is not equal to CD. And this also applies to the same person. For example, AD here has to be different from everything else. Pairwise, all distances are different. You have odd number of people, and let's make it interesting, at least three, because for one person, you know, you're not going to pie anyone. And what do they do? Every person looks at the closest to them other person and pies them. For instance, there are five people here, and it looks to me that C is closest to B, C is going to pi B. What's going to happen to E? E looks like he's going to pi A. A probably is going to pi B. B looks like he's going to pi C. And D, D is very far. I don't think anyone is pieing D. Uh, but D has to throw to someone. I don't know, maybe E. All right. If you were in that fight, what would you like Brady to happen to you? If I was in the fight, I would want to not get pied. <laughs> Correct. So do we have a survivor always? In this picture, we can see that D is definitely a survivor, but does this always happen? Unpied. Unpied. Yeah. So that's the beauty of the problem. Under these restrictions, odd number of people, pairwise different distances, there is always a survivor. So let's write this. Conclusion, there is always a survivor. I'm not claiming uniqueness or any other funky things. There is always a survivor. I've not seen that symbol before. Oh, Brady, we're learning every day. Yeah. Yeah, and there exists a survivor. And you look at this and you say, how can this have anything to do with induction? Of course it has something to do with induction. Most likely because there is an N. These are infinitely many statements. This is like the dominoes. But which statements are we really concerned here? We want S3 to work for three people. We want S5 to work, S7, etc., etc., S sub 2k plus 1. All of the odd statements. And induction will help us show the implication, or if you remember, the evil spell. We're going to keep on even flying like that. All right, so let us see how this works. All right, what's the base step for three people? What kind of triangle can this be? It definitely cannot be equilateral. Can it be isosceles? 
N uh, no, no, you know, no, 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 that's right. So it has to be something called scalene, right? We will label vertices here. You know, in those old movies, Laurel and what was the name? Harry? Hardy. Hardy. Hardy and Laurel. So let us use L and H for them. I have L and H like that, and Brady is going to complete the picture. Well, I've just joined the most famous duo in comedy history. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So in this love-hate triangle, what's going to happen? Since it is a scaling triangle, I have three different sides. And without loss of generality, as mathematicians like to say, I'm going to say that A is, what do you say, less than C, less than B, something like that. Okay. So A is the smallest. Exactly. So what's going to happen? with the L and H. They're going to pie each other. Yeah, Laurel and Hardy are pieing each other. And Brandy is watching from far away. What is Brandy? Brady. <laughs> you got Hardy wrong. You're allowed to get Brady wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. But that B person, what is he going to do? Well, he, he has to pie someone and it looks like C is less than B. So Hardy gets pied twice. And we have a winner. Brady survives. Great. We've done S3. Now by induction. We know how to proceed. Inductive hypothesis. We shall assume that, and this is not going to be strong induction like for the squares. It's going to be a regular induction, but sort of skipping because we don't care about the even cases. So assume that S 2n minus 1 is true. So this S2n minus 1 is the previous statement here. For some n, what should this n be? n cannot be 1 because it's going to be S1. So how about greater than or equal to 2? Because if n is true, you're going to get your S3. And we want to show inductive step that S 2n plus 1 is true. Now, I'm going to use finitely many points, a small number, so you can see how it works. For instance, let's say we are trying to show the seventh statement, but exactly the same idea is going to work for any n. So how many points do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and let's be on the safe side. Seven. Okay, so we've got seven people. We want to immediately eliminate some. And we go for the smallest pairwise distance. In other words, which two people are closest to each other? Looks like those two. And of course, we're going to call them L and H, Laurel and Hardy. So they're going to pie each other because they're indeed closest to each other. Now, what's going to happen with the remaining five people? We are going to cool off our discussion and ask them to play another game, just temporarily. A game only amongst themselves. Only those five people play the game. But that's the previous statement, and we have assumed that the previous statement is true. So what's going to happen for those five people? There has to be a survivor. Just for those five people with this new game, someone survives this new game. So who's going to survive? Brady survives this new game. What would you like Brady to happen in the old game with you? You definitely want to survive the original game with seven people. Yeah. If you survive this one with five, you'd like to survive the original. Yeah. And I claim that you will. So whoever survives the smaller game, I claim that person is going to survive the original bigger game. Okay, so now those people who played the five-person game turn around and start playing the seven-person game. Will any pie be thrown to break? So what, what do you think? Well, what happened before was that any one of those five people playing the new game, they never threw to Brady. So they had a closer target to throw. So in the new game, Brady is not the closest person to them because they already have someone closer. So from them, nothing is going to go to Brady. But what could happen? Could a pie be redirected from the new game to the old game? 
to outside to L or H? And the answer is yes. Maybe this person who before pi someone else here is going to pi hard. That's possible. So some of the pi's in this new game could be redirected to go outside to Laurel and Hardy. Could Laurel and Hardy pie someone in this game? No, because they're the closest to each other under any game. So no pies are going to fly, no new pies are going to fly inside our this, this blue game, which means that Brady is safe. He didn't get pied before, he's not going to get pied now either. And that concludes the inductive step and now we conclude the whole induction by the method of mathematical induction all statements are true in other words as soon as you have odd number of people positioned at different pairwise distances there will be a survivor brady should the survivor be unique how do you mean i mean for every game there should be exactly one survivor is that always going to happen? Mm. I mean, if you have two people very far away from kind of the other ones, it looks like they might both be survivors. They could both throw pies into like the center of the solar system. But not, nothing could go to them. So I'm not claiming that this is a unique survivor is all I'm saying. But I claim that there is a survivor. And now for homework, you can try to create situations where there are more than one survivor, so there is exactly one survivor, for fun to see really what's happening. But what's the burning question that comes when you solve this problem? Even number of people. Even. Why did we exclude the even pie fights, right? Let's see, is S2 true? If you have two people, at pairwise different distances, but there's only one distance between them, right? Laurel and Hardy, there is no survivor. They're just going to pie each other without question. So we already see that for two people, we can't have it. Well, but you say this is, this is really very simple. Maybe I could prove this. It's true for a big bunch number of people, even number, right? For example, how many? 18. Why am I saying 18? Because here is what we're going to do with those 18 people. I'm going to construct for you a counterexample. In other words, I will show you that S18 is not true. We can put them in a valid configuration where there is no survivor. So what do we do with 18 people, Brady? We marry them off in pairs, disregarding their preferences. Just for the sake of mathematics, they'll do it. And now that we have nine pairs of so-so happily married couples, we send them off to the nine planets in the solar system. I'm not going to argue about Pluto, don't even ask me. Okay. <laughs> and we give, of course, to the newlyweds a pie. Okay. Assuming that they actually survive, you know, conditions on these other planets, what's going to happen, Brady? They're going to pie each other. In pairs. Yeah. The, the, the spouses are going to pie each other. There will be no survivor. Why is this happening? Because the planets are so far away from each other, they outweigh any individual distances on a particular planet. And that's why there will be no survivor. So the problem makes absolutely no sense for even number of people. But there is one little glitch that you should have considered. How about this business with different distances? Could we relax that? Could we allow same distances? You would say, well, if I'm at the same distance from Laurel and Hardy and Brady, then whom do I pie? Give them a choice. And will there be still a survivor? Could we be only sure that there will be a survivor? The answer is no, because the simplest situation of odd number of people that form an equilateral triangle is going to be a counterexample. They have a choice. So let's say Laurel decides to pie Hardy and Brady decides to pie Laurel. Is Brady safe? No, because Hardy could choose to pie Brady.
And so in this situation, you don't have a survivor. So if you give this freedom of choice to people with possibly equal pairwise distances, they may not be a survivor. So you cannot relax the conditions of the problem. The perfect problem is exactly what we solved. Odd number of people at pairwise uh, different distances. And just to be clear, you can have an even number of people and have a survivor. But, yes. but you've shown that there's always a ch yeah, you could always yeah, yeah. do it with it. Yeah. Absolutely. You can put all of the other, uh, how many people, 20, 19 people inside this room and send Brady to the moon, right? Who's going to touch Brady? Brady is untouchable and he will survive that even game too. Yeah. So it is possible. We're not finished with induction just yet. In fact, in the next video, Zvezda is going to go back to 1988 and the legendary question six from the Math Olympiad, which she managed to solve using, you guessed it, induction. There are links on the screen and in the video description. Really poorly the night beforehand, I basically didn't sleep. I was so tired. I knew that if I don't solve the problems very quickly, I'm just not going to survive the test. And they give you four and a half hours for three problems every day. So this is day two. 